Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. Got some breaking news to get to here. Uh, we have also going to get to a viral video of a woman at a gym claiming she's being harassed by this terrible, toxic man. Does it? Is that really what it shows? We'll show it to you and let you be the judge. This, as uh, we get breaking news now on Vice President Mike Pence, former Vice President Mike Pence, who, guess what? Also just found classified documents at his residence. <laughs> They're coming out of their ears. Uh, very happy to have back on the show, Amala Eka. Let me say it. Let me get it right. Epinobi. Thank you, Amala. Amala Epinobi, back with us, host of Unapologetic Live. And we are welcoming Federalist writer Evita Duffy Alfonso to the show for her very first appearance. After a busy holiday season, now is the time to make time for you. Think about that. What a novel concept. Whether you want to refresh your fitness routine or just enjoy some relaxation, a Michael Phelps Signature Swim Spa by Master Spas can be something you enjoy now and for the seasons to come. Making time for yourself, even if it's a 20-minute swim or sitting in the hot tub seats in a Michael Phelps Swim Spa, can be incredibly beneficial to your mental health and your physical health. And that's what Master Spas is all about, helping you live life better. A Michael Phelps swim spa combines the benefits of a pool with the therapy of a hot tub. It comes in a variety of sizes to complement almost any yard, even if it's a small backyard. Exercising in the water is a great way to include physical activity into your daily life. Whether you're a beginner or a fitness enthusiast just looking to add in some cross-training or something new to your routine, Michael Phelps swim spas are 100% made in the USA by Master Spas, the world's largest swim spa manufacturer. A Michael Phelps swim spa is energy efficient. You can use it all year long. Go to masterspas.com, put in the promo code MK to save a thousand bucks on a Michael Phelps swim spa or 500 bucks on a master spas hot tub. Masterspas.com, promo code MK. Great to have you both here. Thanks for having us. Oh my gosh. You can't stop it. Uh, Honestly, like there's more classified documents floating around with these former presidents and vice presidents than I drop F-bombs on this show. And that's saying something, okay? <laughs> so Mike Pence decided, out of an abundance of caution, to go back and check his documents, given everything that's going on. And lo and behold, they found some, quote, small number, I don't know exactly how many that is, um, of documents bearing classified markings in his Carmel, Indiana home, from his time as vice president. This, despite the fact that in November, he went on a press tour and said to the Associated Press, to ABC, the following. you take any classified documents with you from the White House? Uh, I, I did not. Um, Do you see any reason for anyone to take classified documents with them leaving the White House? Well, there'd be no reason to have classified documents, particularly if they were in an unprotected area. No, there wouldn't. But like Trump said, everyone has done it. (laughs) Right? It's amazing, Amla, where where you see like the truth coming out now and all these holier than thou. I would never. It's disgusting how irresponsible. Not saying it's exactly the same. I'm just saying Trump's basic point that he is not the only one to have this stuff on his property has been proven. Right. I'm thinking, is this just something that we have not been checking regular on a regular basis uh, for yes. classified documents in these people's houses? Yes. And now everybody's just a culprit here. And, you know, Pence really should have checked, you know, his, his properties before he went on and made that statement. It was a bad move on his part. That's exactly right. So he, why would you go out there, Evita, right? And be so, so bold in your pronouncement that, no, I didn't bring any. And like the somber tone of like, and it's, you know, no, it, why would you? That everyone, including Pence, who we think is going to challenge Trump for the presidency, for the nomination, the GOP, um, you know, they're out there tis- tisking, like it's just not done. And now we find out it's done by almost everyone. Yeah, I mean, it's so it's so hypocritical, and especially because Mike Pence said after the Trump raid that he didn't have any classified documents. He went on the record and told all these media outlets that he's he's not he's not guilty of that. Trump might be, but not me. Um, and and we have to also think why why now why why come forward you know admitting that you you have had these classified you had these classified documents in your home. 
I don't know about you guys, but I, my theory is that this is all about a presidential run and that he's afraid it's going to come out. Maybe there was an investigation that he became aware of and that it was going to come out later on and maybe mm-hmm. in a primary or in a general election. So he's trying to get ahead of it. Either way, though, it's just it's so hypocritical and 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 very ridiculous, the whole thing. I, You know, I've been saying for a couple of weeks now, let's let's do this. Let's go to Bill Clinton. Let's go to George W. Bush. Let's go to Jimmy Carter. Let's do it. Let's have them all. Right. If you don't think Bill Clinton has got classified documents in his home, you're crazy. He 100%. We just, we don't, we didn't have a nosy national archivist tapping on all the shoulders of those people the way we did with Trump. And now the latest, so Biden doesn't know, know where to land on this. You know, he, he realizes, I think that he's ruined any chance of prosecution against Trump. But now he's got to worry about whether this is going to be a huge political problem for him. So he comes out with the, no regrets, no regrets, I'm good. I'm definitely not Trump. I'm proper. I did everything right. And now, and then like out comes another tranche of documents after he said that. So now they've got a new spokesperson going over to the White House um, who's going to speak, I guess, more than Corinne Jean-Pierre is going to on this. And this is the new messaging, okay, from the Biden team on on really what's going on here. Number one, it's the fault of the media. And number two, just in case you weren't aware, they did everything properly. Listen. Yeah, I think that there's some of this that in every presidency, you know, there are many people uh, out there uh, in the media who sort of try to stir up controversy to get attention or uh, or time uh, on camera. The underlying issue that we're talking about here is that as soon as the president's personal team noticed something, they immediately and promptly and transparently disclose that to the proper authorities. Okay, so a couple of things there. It's not the media's fault. It's, it's not. It's his guy's fault. But secondly, as soon as his personal lawyers, as soon as the, his personal lawyers found it, why are his personal lawyers allowed to look for classified documents? They didn't have a security clearance. They notified the proper authorities. We know now from reporting that's been in the press, as well as Andy McCarthy's review over at National Review, he didn't notify the proper authorities. What they did, the personal lawyers, they, they called the White House. They called mm-hmm. the White House. They did not call justice. And then the White House let the National Archives know. Again, they did not call justice. The National Archives did not call justice. It was the inspector general at the National Archives who said, holy shit, we better call justice. Like, we don't want to get pulled into this nonsense. And finally, that guy called justice and justice started looking at it, and it was buried for several months before the press got wind of it, and CBS broke the story just now. So I love the revisionist history. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we all know that they're fans of revisionist history over there. What they're trying to do is run cover. They wanted to see who was going to be implicated in this first. They wanted to see how it was going to affect them. And that's why they make this call to the White House before anybody in the justice system hears what's going on. It's very much like what children do. You know, I I stole the cookie from the cookie jar. Let me ask my brother how I'm going to get in trouble for this. And then we'll go tell mom that we went and did this. It's exactly what's happening here. And I have a feeling Mike Pence is going to probably have a very similar tune. Yes, I had these classified documents. I stole the cookie from the cookie jar, but I let mom know as soon as I realized that was the case. He uh, comes out of Ida and basically says, oh, you know, reporters always want their moment on camera. This is not that. The reason there have been a couple of spicy exchanges at the White House uh, press office this past week is because Corinne Jean-Pierre keeps coming out lying to them. She keeps coming out and giving them misinformation to to be charitable to her. We found everything. We're sure. The team has acknowledged. They've told me. They've assured me. They found everything. Another tranche. No, this time it's real. Another tranche. She tried being indignant. Another tranche. Whatever. And the reporters, even from the mainstream press, are starting to get irritated at the dishonesty. This isn't the, this particular issue is not the fault of the media. Yeah, they they have this whole narrative that everything they've done has been so clean, so perfect, nothing like Trump. But I mean, if we're just looking at the the, the facts of the, the both situations, Trump and then Pence and Biden, there's a difference in their positions, right? Trump was the president, and Joe mm-hmm. Biden and and uh, Mike Pence were vice presidents, and this is where these classified documents came from. They did not have the ability to declassify any of this, right? I mean, that's where we have to start from, and yes, and Trump uh, Trump did have that right. So I I think that we're even going to to think about this idea that this is like, this is a clean in any way possible, I, I think is, is just so dishonest from the White House. Mm. 
Well, that one's not the media's fault, but this one in part is. The coverage of these mass shooting events that we've seen over the past couple of days in California. So not one, but two mass shootings in the course of 36 to 48 hours in California. The first one uh, happened out near uh, Monterey. A gunman killed 11 people and shot several more. Um, It was at uh, at a Lunar New Year celebration, which is an important holiday for many Asian American communities. And almost immediately, you had some of the media and leftist politicians run with bigotry, hate. This is a hate crime because of who was killed. But that inquiry requires more facts before you can settle on bigotry. And by the way, then there was a second one uh, just yesterday with seven killed um, in uh, Northern California as a 67-year-old man came and killed uh, seven people. It looks like a workplace violence mass murder. Uh, at several farms in local like around the area, and he was said to be a farm worker. He worked at one of those facilities. So, here's what you get. Okay, in the buildup. Okay, before we knew much more than it was 72 year old. Before we even knew it was 72 72 year old guy who did the first one, Asian man. Both both shooters Asian men, shooting other Asian workers. Uh, we get this from Chuck Schumer. We must stand up to bigotry and hate. That's what he tweeted out. Monterey. It's Asian on Asian crime, okay? Then we get Adam Schiff. I mean, these are not small names in the Democratic Party. Uh, Bigotry is a possible motive here. Okay, what? Why are you even mentioning? You don't know. How do you know that? You know nothing yet. Say nothing. Wisconsin State Representative um, Francesca Hong, we are broken as a nation to have white supremacy reign terror. White supremacy, right? So no, no one here, as far as I know, Amala, has gone back to correct the record now that we know that this is not a hate crime as it's defined under the law. This wasn't about white supremacy. Both of these were about something very different. Right. And I'll go out on a strong limb here and say that they never will go out and correct the record. They're never going to come and say, you know what, we were wrong about our initial statements on this shooting. And this is what they do every time with every single breaking news story that they have. They run with the narrative of bigotry, of white supremacy, because that's the lens through which they look at the world. Everything is an act of racism. Everything is an act of bigotry, even if you have no facts and no evidence to back up the claim that you're making. Because if you run with that initial narrative, that is what people soak in. People aren't checking back into the news to find out what is the identity of this actual right. actual shooter? Why is he of retirement age? Why are both of these men of retirement age, which is something that is not typical of these mass shootings that we experience here in the United States? Nobody's ever going to go back and check. They heard white supremacy. That's what sticks. And that's what the media relies on. And now we have, Evita, now that we know that both of these men were, were of Asian descent, here's how it reads now in the Associated Press. A 67-year-old man, nothing about his race. Suddenly, we don't mention the race, okay? New York Times, a 72-year-old man and a 67-year-old man committed these murders. Suddenly, the race gets totally ignored because it doesn't support the narrative, you see? So it, so now, we're just not going to mention it. We're just going to let people question and just go with the old tweets they saw from Chuck Schumer and Adam Schiff. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting about this, that one of these shootings was in Oakland, California, which is has some of the strictest gun laws in in the country, similar to Chicago, Mm -hmm. where I was for four years, lots of shootings, lots of killings, lots of violence. Um, And and they they always are talking about equity. That's why they want to frame these these shootings around race before they even know that that's the reason um, behind the shooting. And and yet the people that are being hurt the most by the way that these these equitable race conscious politicians are running these these cities, running these states um, is is minorities. Right. I mean, like if we're really going to have a conversation about minorities and, and and things being unjust, Let's talk about how many minorities live in communities that have excessively strict gun laws, cannot defend themselves, um, and and are are completely at the victim of these lawless neighborhoods. You know what? It's it's so true because the literally Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, said we have the strictest gun laws in the country here in California. You cannot get any tougher on the gun restrictions than California. I looked up just a couple of them. Um, Mandatory waiting periods, background checks, um, military-style weapons are banned, red flag laws, uh, new laws targeting gun dealers, 
restricting the types of guns that can be sold, short barrel shotguns banned, rifles banned um, of certain types, ghost guns banned, and so on. So what we always get, always in the wake of these, is we got to get the guns. It, there's Right now, there's a renewed push by President Biden for let's bring back the assault weapons ban. It's like the we couldn't have any more gun laws on the books in California because we do have a Second Amendment. So you really couldn't constitutionally have more gun laws on the books in California. The criminals don't abide by the gun laws. You could put as many on there as you want. They don't abide by the gun laws, Amala. Right. They're they're pushing this. And I, I live here in Los Angeles, so I'm experiencing uh, the woes of their progressive policy every single day. I work really closely with police officers in South Central, which is one of the most dangerous areas here in Los Angeles. And they are talking about how emboldened these people feel to commit crimes because of the policies that are being put in place. Not only are we punishing law-abiding citizens and taking away their rights to protect themselves, but we are then looking to criminals and saying, you know what, here's a policy that's going to make your life easier, where right now you might be committing crimes and being placed in jail. Now we're not even going to arrest you anymore. It's decriminalized to shoplift. We have smash and grabs happening all over the place. Gangs have been emboldened to continue with their activity and become far more aggressive and far more violent. And all because people like Gavin Newsom and our, our local legislators are allowing this to happen. It's much like the streets of, of Chicago, where uh, gun mm -hmm. violence is happening on a daily basis. And nobody cares. And minorities and people of color are going to be the ones most affected by this. You're in L.A. Evita was in Chicago at the University of Chicago for four years. I'm just outside of New York City. All three of these cities have seen massive crime spikes. And what's interesting is, so uh, by the way, this guy, I want to learn more, but the 72-year-old shooter, he had been arrested for having an illegal firearm not long ago. So what happened there? I mean, right. what we've seen so many in these cases is some soft on crime prosecutor if, if there is an arrest, does nothing about it. So it's like, okay, well, great to have all those laws on the books. Are you actually going to enforce them? Because why yeah. was this guy, why do he still have all these fire, firearms? What was done to him in the criminal justice system? Let's find out. Let's probe that. Um, but Chicago is a, in a very interesting position right now, Evita. Um, Lori Lightfoot looks like she's going to lose. It's, it's incredible. She was elected as mayor in 2019. Anything could happen. But right now she's polling in fourth place for this upcoming mayoral race. Now, it's one of those things where if you don't get over 50%, then they have a runoff a couple of months later. And, you know, those can wind up, you can wind up winning even if you are in fourth place uh, into the first vote. But she's struggling. And there are, like, the, the guy who's at the top, who's, like, secretly more right-leaning, uh, has got, like, double digits, what she has in this race. And what they're saying is, in large part, it is because of the soaring crime in that city. 2021 was a record year for murders. In Chicago, they hit 800, 800 Chicagoans murdered in that year alone. It's gone down in 2022. It had no place to go but down. But what do you make of what's happening in Chicago with the rising crime and the potential fall of Lori Lightfoot? I wish that <laughs> Lori Lightfoot would fall. I I have to tell you, Megan, it's the, the Chicago machine is real. And at the end of every election, somehow, whoever is, is totally wrong for the city ends up winning. Um, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of, there's a lot of corruption, but I will say from my reporting and being in Chicago, actually talking to people, they have really turned on her. Will, will that be reflected in, in, in the election results? I'm not sure, but they are extremely concerned about the crime in the city, not just the people who are in the traditionally dangerous neighborhoods. People on the north side are extremely concerned about the crime. I talked to a police officer who said, our force is bleeding because of Lori Lightfoot. Lori Lightfoot um, doesn't have their back during BLM. She she left them all out to dry. There's a perception of that. I this, and then, Mind you, this is a black officer that I was talking to telling me this. He also said that during the vaccine mandates, um, they she she said, you know, if you if you don't get the vaccine, you're off the force. Many of them had to leave. There is constant violence, constant crime. Um, people are are having to because they can't defend themselves, walking around with knives to defend themselves. Particularly, like we talked mm. about before, people in black and Hispanic communities. I know you went out and did some man on the street interviews on crime there. I think we've got a little bit of that queued up so the audience can see it. Sot six. Lori Lightfoot has said recently that since she's taken office, the city's a lot safer. Do you agree with that? No. No. Tell me why. It's been going a lot going on in this area, especially since Lori Lightfoot has been in here. So it's like it's not safer. She didn't do nothing. Me living in this community is not safe. 
I have to walk down the street with a knife just to go home. The folks know they they were were they street vendors. No, so th those that that was just a woman in in West Lawndale, which is one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Chicago. But mm -hmm. the street vendors are an Hispanic neighborhood um, in Little Village, and many of them are actually undocumented immigrants, um, and which is why they have they are street vendors. They can't get regular jobs, many of them, and they because they're on the side of the street because they they are um, you know using ca on a cash only basis. Many of them are very vulnerable to to robberies, and not just any kind of robberies armed robberies, men coming mm -hmm. with machine guns pointed at their heads. I mean, people in this city, in Chicago, are absolutely traumatized by what's happened. And I think that's why many of them have just said, we, we need to change. Lori Lightfoot has not done anything for us. She doesn't seem to care let's about get, us. Let's get more cops on the street. Let's enforce the laws as written on the books. Let's throw the book at people who oh, take a, these, these weapons and threaten their street vendors. Or we could do what Lori Lightfoot is proposing. Um, this is her proposed solution. Here it is, SOT 7. I heard a lot of rhetoric here, a lot of sound bites, but not a lot of concrete solution on how we get the job done and make our residents and our workers safe. We're doing how it do you every thinking? single day. I think the follow up is, and your solution is? I just explained it. We have been in Little Village working with those street vendors, understanding what the nature of the crime is, <clears throat> making sure that we're doing things in concert with them okay. to help them uh, uh, make sure that their money is secure, not use money, if at all possible, using um, okay. other forms of transactions to take care of themselves. Don't use cash. She said it a couple of times. Don't use cash. The street vendors. Oh, okay. So take away the cash. But how about getting some cops? out there to help them? How about keeping criminals behind bars so that they're not running rampant in the streets? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, oh, go ahead, Amal, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she's ahead, looking at these people and essentially saying, well, it's your fault that this is happening to you and you just need to uh, adjust. It's very uh, similar to the narrative we got surrounding inflation. This is all natural. It's your fault that you're not adjusting. You expect too much from this country. And that's what she's telling the citizens of Chicago. Yeah, and it's not just Chicago, Evita. I mean, it's, just in in New York City, of course, we've seen record crime here, and the the subways. I, I pulled the latest numbers. It was um, since 2020, there have been roughly 21 killings in the subway system. I mean, this used to be so safe. I've lived in New York for a long time, lived my whole life in New York State. Um, when I was a young lawyer here in the late 90s, I was on the subway every day, multiple times a day. You, you didn't see it. nobody was getting shot, nobody's getting killed. We'd already had Giuliani cleaning up the the cities. Uh, the, the streets and so on. And then we had such a blessed period of Giuliani, Bloomberg, where they funded the cops, they prosecuted crime. And then that loser, Mayor de Blasio, took over and the street, everything went to hell. It went to hell, thanks to him. He was too busy smoking his pot and promoting his wife's stupid videos of her cooking and not worried about keeping the streets safe. So we've had 21 killings in the subway system since 2020. Um, and that's more than the 20 murders that were recorded between 2008 and 2019 combined. That's crazy. Is that, is that must be, I wonder if that's 2008 or 2019. In any event, I'll get the, the stats from the New York Post. Um, so bad that the Fox News weatherman, Adam Klotz, had an extraordinary thing happen to him two days ago. He was riding the subway home from having watched a Giants game with some buddies. He said it was after midnight. It was like 1245 in the morning crowded subway. And um, well, I'll let him tell it what happened to him. He saw a guy in trouble, some gang members or some some young guys, seven guys beating up on an old man. He stepped in. Here he is. Last night, coming home from watching the Giants game at a bar uh, on the subway, uh, this older gentleman was being hassled by this group of like seven or eight teens. And I was like, yo, guys, cut that out. And they decided, all right, if he's not going to get it, then you're going to get it. And boy, did they give it to me. Uh, they had me on the ground, like my ribs are all kind of bruised up too. They they got they, they got their hits in, uh, but that guy he got out of there. He's fine, and the cops grabbed a couple of these kids, and you know I got X-rays. I'm okay. This is all gonna heal. So it's all good. You know what I mean? New York City, New York City. Ah, oh, what a place. The Big Apple. Ah, uh, he's. I'm sure he's. You know. Making light of it there, you know, to his credit, he's not leaning into, poor me, but he, I'm sure he's traumatized. 
I'm sure that was extremely traumatic for him. They lit the guy's hair on fire, an elderly man. So Adam, the weather guy, steps in to say, yo, what are you doing? And they beat the hell out of him. That's life in New York now, Evita. Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say how how brave of him. And we're always demonizing men and toxic masculinity. And what an amazingly brave example of of a man standing up and and doing what's right and and suffering the consequences of it, but but doing what was right ultimately. But I, I think, I mean... I had a classmate that was that was shot um, in the Chicago subway. I think many people that live in, in New York and Chicago and L.A., they have experiences like that, know someone who's been through something like that, and they just don't want to stay there. I mean, pe- people are fleeing these major American cities and, and moving to other places that work better for them. I, you know, I, I recently graduated, and it's been really interesting to talk to my friends. Where, where did you want to go once you left college? Not not one of them actually of my, of my friend group stayed in Chicago. And I don't know anybody who went to New York. I know people who went to Nashville. I know people who went to Dallas. I know people who went to Miami, but they're just not interested in this. And I think once people start to really leave they'll and, and it starts to hurt the economy, hopefully these, these leftist mayors will start to turn things around. But until things get to a really terrible point, I, I think these cities are going to continue to bleed and just keep getting worse. Mm, my God. A couple, the couple that they managed to arrest were apparently juveniles. And so they're going to have a juvenile record, which will then be expunged and they'll go on to, I'm sure, continue a life of crime um, and hurt somebody else. And that, that's how it goes. That's how it goes. Uh, we don't have a, a mayor now who cares much about fighting crime either. We thought, you know, Mayor, mayor Eric Adams was going to change things. He, so far, no, he hasn't. He has a light, light on crime DA as well. That's been well documented. Uh, well, one place they should not go, but might, Evita, when they graduate from college, is Atlanta. Um, I say that because the people going to Atlanta right now are apparently runny-nosed, snotty-nosed, elite university, well-educated, rich, privileged kids who want to go burn cop cars in the name of environmentalism, I think, um, because they have nothing else better to do. I mean, that's what we're seeing. So Atlanta is finds itself the subject of riots because they're refunding cops. They're building what's, they're calling it like a cop center um, where they can train more police and so on. And this has become a big issue because people hate cops on the left and because they're going to have to knock down some trees (laughs) to build this center. So these kids are out there and they're protesting and they're angry. And in in the course of all of this, um, someone got shot. Someone got uh, killed. And they had taken a shot at a cop and they actually hit the cop. And then the cops shot back at this protester and um, the, the the protester died. So now we have riots because cops are bad because we have to believe that this is all made up. The cops weren't actually shot at, even though we apparently have a very injured police officer. And it's spiraling, right? It's spiraling. And it looks very much, um, according to Andy Noe's reporting, which you can read in the New York Post in addition on his Twitter. This thing, this whole thing has been taken over by, by Antifa. You've got, he did a profile, a piece profiling the many young people who had already uh, committed some crimes in some cases, but who have now been charged with felony domestic terrorism. Uh, and they're from out of state and they're pampered children. Francis Carroll, 22 of Maine, uh, had already been out on bail for a domestic terrorism arrest. Um, as a result of Francis's behavior in Atlanta. Francis is the son of a yacht-sailing multimillionaire family and hails from the wealthy main city of Kennebunkport. Uh, he had been living in his parents' mansion before going to Atlanta, and so on. Then there's Madeline Henry Fiola, 22 of Spokane, Washington, a trans non-binary activist, 2022 alumna of Oberlin College, of course, where they studied archaeological studies with a focus on decolonization from Portland, Oregon, a wealthy suburb, of ha- Happy Valley. Uh, then you've got Emily Murphy of Gross Isle, Michigan, middle-class vegan activist, again, according to the Post, um, who used to chair Al Gore's Climate Reality Project organization because, before becoming further radicalized into eco-ideology. There's a guy named Ivan Ferguson, 23, of Henderson, Nevada, award-winning classically trained clarinetist <laughs> hmm, who studied at the prestigious San Francisco Conservatory of Music, before they decided to cart into Atlanta and cause a ton of trouble there as part of far-left extremist behavior. So um, that's what's happening there. Bored kids who have too much time on their hands and a ton of privilege 
who want to go out there and support people who have shot cops and these guys are setting cop cars on fire, et cetera. How are we supposed to view this? I mean, I would love to say that I'm surprised by this, but I'm I'm not at all. Every time that I go to visit a college campus to maybe tell my story or talk about the state of political discourse today, I am met with protesters, and those protesters are largely highly educated, supposedly highly educated, white privileged students who come to take on the names of, of people of color and underprivileged people and say that they're fighting some battle. And that's exactly what these Antifa kids are doing. They're they're essentially children at this point who are going out throwing a tantrum in the middle of the streets. And I can't think of a worse way to show the world that you need less police than setting cars on fire and burning things down to the ground and looting and stealing and robbing and all these things that Antifa and their fellow thugs are engaging in. Really, they're proving our point for us, so I will give them that. But it's a shame that people are getting hurt in the process. Property is being damaged. But what they're doing is exposing themselves to rational, reasonable people, which I believe uh, is still most of the world and most of the United States. And they're going to be brought to task. It's very similar to these Just Stop Oil protesters that we're seeing all around the world who are throwing yeah. soup at, at Van Gogh paintings. They're always privileged white kids, highly educated, who have never had a, a, an ounce of oppression in their lives. Yes, yes. Remember all the white women from the Upper West Side yelling at the black cops about how they were racists during the BLM <laughs> protests? Right. And that it, it, interesting fact about um, Amala, you were— you once were of the left and actually got, I'm told, a BLM tattoo. So you, yeah. you sort of came to these realizations very organically, but for a period of time, you've been sucked into this weird ideology before you actually just paid attention to the facts and saw things differently. Yeah, I mean, regrettably, I was a, a very active member of the left. My, my BLM tattoo, for those of you watching, is on my arm here. And it's all because my world was reduced down to things like race and gender. And when you look at the world through that lens, you will find racism and bigotry where there is none. And you will seek out activism because that's what you're taught. You're taught that you need to group together, band together, convince other people of their oppression. And you need to fight this, this white capitalist male who's holding you all down. And you do that by any means necessary. And that's why Antifa claims to be tolerant and nonviolent and is doing all of this stuff in the streets, burning things down, killing people, uh, because they are essentially brainwashed into thinking that this is what they need to do to have a prosperous life in the future, or at least create create one for uh, generations to come. Mm -hmm. But instead of, you know, we, we, where they're not actually burning things down, your lying eyes are deceiving you, if that's what you saw. I mean, we did see the burning cop cars. Uh, and the Atlanta police chief says that uh, they found multiple protesters with explosive devices on them. That's what was used to set that Atlanta police car on fire. Some members began smashing property. They were throwing bricks at Atlanta PD vehicles, smashing property. Some cops got hurt as well. Um, and yet you've got David Peisner freelance journalist, I'm putting that term in air quotes, on CNN, who sees it this way. I think that there's a real blurring of the lines in, in, in the use of the word violence. Is property destruction violence? Um, to some people, it certainly is. Um, but, you know, th this idea that breaking windows or, or, or other acts of property destruction are the same as uh, actual violence against humans. You know, you keep using these words, violent, 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 violent. Um, and it, it gives the impression, I mean, the only violence that, that or, or the only acts of, of violence against people that I saw were, were actually police tackling protests. Pay no attention to those bombs that they have on them, Evita. That's, that's not... It's not really violent if you just throw it on the cop car. Like, were the cops actually in it? Was anybody? So no, it's fine. Your thoughts? This this kind of denialism, it actually makes me pretty mad. I, It's for us on the right. I think we look at them in, in these kind of crazy hairstyles and their gender, you know, queer and non-conforming and all this stuff. And it can be easy to sort of dismiss them and say, you know, they're they're not that much of a threat. They're confused about who they are, right? And the truth is that they are a real threat. This is a terrorist organization. Um, in 2020, I, I went to Kenosha, Wisconsin and did um, reporting after the shooting of Jacob Blake. And the first night, no, the the people in the community were there. They was a peaceful protest. They held up signs. They were upset about what happened. 
once the Antifa protesters from, from Portland started to pour into the city, then things got bad. They burned down the entire um, uptown uh, Kenosha, Kenosha area, um, millions of dollars in damage. This is a, a, a very small community. And, and, and this is happening. I mean, it has happened in Kenosha and it's, it's close to my heart. I'm, I live near there. Right. And I, I think that's the same for many Americans across the country, people that live in Atlanta, terrorized by these privileged, awful, snobbish children. Um, and, and we'd like, we, we are dismissing them, right? A lot of people on the right, because they're crazy. We think they're crazy, but also people on the left saying that they're not that dangerous. And the truth is they are, and we need to start calling them for what they are, which is terrorists. Yeah. You know who used to, who used the same def defense of I only damage property? Bill Ayers, founder of the Weather Underground. They blew up a lot of buildings and they blew up a lot of people. That's how it goes. Uh, so we ignore this kind of violence at our own risk. All right, much, much more to get to, including this person who went completely viral online for claiming she was being harassed by some guy at a gym. We'll let you be the judge when Amala and Vita take and Avita take that case on next. Don't go away. Is your business still using spreadsheets and emails to manage important sales commission? Is your support and operations staff stretched thin? Are your salespeople constantly trying to piece together the puzzle for what they're going to get paid for and what's potentially missing? Headache. This is where ClearComp comes in. ClearComp is a one-stop shop for your business to manage sales commission documentation like commission plan info, product info, and facts. It's basically a sales operations and sales enablement dream platform. ClearComp works seamlessly and securely with your existing software applications for your billing, CRM, HR. You get the picture. Your sales team will perform their best with real-time results and earnings using ClearComp's interactive dashboards. And your operations team will be able to make commission plan adjustments with just a few clicks. So please, get this done already. Modernize your sales organization. Improve your business today by visiting clearcomp.com. That's C-L-E-A-R-C-O-M-P.com. Book a demo and tell them I sent you. And that brings me to Jessica Fernandez. I don't know who Jessica Fernandez is. Um, however, I'm told she's a Twitch partner. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> All I know is she posted this absurd video, and it now has over 40 million views on Twitter, um, over 660,000 on TikTok, and I could go on. Now, for the listening audience, stay with me, because it's, she's hard to hear, and it's not going to be that meaningful to you. It's more meaningful to the YouTubers, but I'm going to explain to the listening audience what we're seeing. Um, it's this young woman in the in the gym in like you know that you know, I wouldn't say she's covered up. She's got sort of the skimpy gym outfit on. She's doing her little workout like her th hip thrusts. And in the back, you see a man who's I think minding his own business. And as I can count it, maybe once looks over at her. She's filming herself muttering expletives into her camera, her microphone, which she's holding. And then he comes over and offers to help her reload the weights. Here it is. This is how to not approach girls at the gym. I hate this. I hate this. I hate when they're sweet. It's so uncomfortable. Feral, 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 feral. Like fucking feral. Excuse me? You don't have to do that. It's okay. No, no, it's okay. I got it. Thank you, though. Jessica is outraged over this. Again, literally, if you watch this online, you'll see him look at her, I think, one time. from uh, he's, and, and probably because she's holding a big camera up. Okay, th these are her tweets, gals. This guy kept making me extremely uncomfortable at the gym. This is why I'll end up crying on stream because I feel so grossed out at times with the amount of sexualization I experience. Hopefully this spreads awareness for girls who experience this type of treatment at the gym. And she goes on. I can see how this makes me look like I have an inflated ego, but I am an attractive girl in a beauty standard sense, and I get extremely sexually harassed online, and it makes trusting random strangers that approach me trigger my trauma. Oh my God. Which is why I respond this way. And she goes on to add, I'm also extremely antisocial, and being hit on is never a compliment to me. I despise being sexualized. So raise your hand if you believe any of that, if you believe one word of what she just tweeted. No, no hands up. Nope. No, 
No hands up, Amala, because she clearly <laughs> no. does not mind being sexualized. It seems to be her bread and butter, but she loves to play the victim. Oh, yeah, this is peak victimhood culture, and we're seeing it all over the place now. If you go to that girl's Instagram, you'll see pictures of her butt in the mirror. You'll see her in a Playboy bunny costume. So she really hates being sexualized by people on the internet. She despises it. And really, what this is, and in a broader sense, is such a disservice to women because there are actual women who go to the gym and who maybe are harassed by men, or maybe there are perverts who are coming up to these women and trying to engage in some sort of activity that we would view as unsavory. But because you you are, we are in this believe all women phase where you can quite mm-hmm. literally take a video of a man doing no wrong, post it on the internet, accuse him of doing wrong and have him be attacked. It's just like, we do not know our heads from our asses anymore in, in this culture. <laughs> yes. And she deserves to be called out for it. And she has been luckily. Yes. Evita, she's got, um, it's a fan house account, which is apparently a competitor to only fans where you go on there and you post all this saucy stuff because you want to be admired and charge people for it. Um, And she's like, all DMs will be responded to directly. And so, okay, so this person is not um, someone who despises being sexualized and feels so grossed out at times with the amount of sexualization she experiences. She's experiencing it because she's, she's asking, she's literally putting out sexualized content and asking people to message her about it. She's clearly not someone who cares about being sexualized whatsoever. Otherwise, she'd make money in a different way. But I I, I think what was so interesting is the phrasing, right? She said that he's making me so uncomfortable. She feels so, so scared and terrified and traumatized by the whole thing. The only person that's making people in the gym uncomfortable are the people that record themselves in the gym. And then you're in their <laughs> shop. I've gone to the gym with that's several true. people in quality. Is, yeah, I go to the gym and, and people, especially newbies, they don't want to be recorded while they're trying to work no. out. And these like excessively narcissistic gym culture um, girls will come to the gym with their cameras and their lighting and their makeup on while they're working out um, and expect all of us to step out of frame. It's ridiculous. There, she's oh the one God. making people uncomfortable. This man was clearly minding his own business. And it was so wrong of her to put him on blast, on blast for the, all, the whole internet to then call him some creep when, again, the real weirdo is her for recording everyone in the gym. Right. I haven't been to a gym forever. Otherwise, I'd probably know about this trend. But how uncomfortable. No, I wouldn't want to be somebody's background of, of their live stream or their video shot. And she falsely maligned this guy. I mean, it would have been even worse for him Maybe if she didn't have the camera and she went online and did one of the tearful, like, I got sexualized and I got harassed. And then we'd be wondering, like, who did this, right? Like this guy, whatever, who his name might have come out. He would have been unfairly smeared. This, ladies, is why, this is why we have a headline in the news today, which, I mean, uh, it's, it'll come to the surprise of nobody. Time's up is closing. It's done. It's officially done. I don't know if you knew it was still around, but there's a reason that Time's Up was not able to sustain itself. This organization that was so lauded, $24 million of money poured into that organization in 2018 when they first formed at the height of the Me Too movement um, with an original mission that was noble, right? To help women who'd been harassed in the workplace fight back, fight for their legal rights. And boy, did they run far afield. Just to take you back on the messaging when this thing was first born and the amount of star power behind it. This is, I think, the Golden Globes 2018. One, two, three, time up! So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. Folks, time's up. I have daughters. Like, I don't want this stuff happening. I thought that I would have to raise my daughter to learn how to protect herself and defend herself against the world. And what I've realized is that we can hand our daughters a different world. It's very, very beautiful and exciting and saying the time is out. Even in the music business, we haven't even touched that ball of wax or whatever we want to call it. A lot of things have come out of the darkness and into the light. So I think right now we have the chance to be heard and that's why we're doing it. Um, We're all doing it because we're asking to try and elicit change. You know what? No one has spoken up now. That this organization is halting its operations. It's giving the paltry amount, like 1.7 million bucks it has left to its legal defense fund. And none of those actresses that I remember came out when this organization was imploding. Be- why? Because when Andrew Cuomo got accused, they sided with him. 
They advised him, not those women, but the head of Time's Up at the time, advised, uh, I think her name is Tina Chen, I'm trying to check it, and Roberta Kaplan. Um, they advised him behind the scenes, and then Chen initially discouraged other Time's Up leaders from commenting publicly on the allegations being brought against him by Lindsey Boylan and others. They sided with him. Why? Because he's a Democrat. You and I both know it. And it wasn't just this incident. It was when Tara Reid came out and accused Joe Biden, and she went to Time's Up, and what's her name? Anita Dunn, who's running Biden's communication, was running their communication, and suddenly Time's Up didn't have the time to help Tara Reid in her quest against who? Another Democrat. This organization embarrassed itself. They were the Believe All Women crew. They crushed Brett Kavanaugh with allegations that were laughable from people like Julie Swetnick, and they did this to themselves. And I want to hear those actresses come out and say they're sorry, and that they'll fund a new organization that gets back to mission focus of helping anyone, whether they're accusing a Democrat or a Republican who has been harassed at the office. Otherwise, they can pound sand. I wouldn't take their money, and I wouldn't have the association with them. I'm fired up about this because it had a good cause. It could have helped a lot of people, and instead, they went partisan, and that's why they imploded. Okay, Amala, <laughs> thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do I follow that? I will say that what with Time's Up and hashtag Me Too, these are movements for the moment. It's only meant for the moment that they say them in. They want to virtue signal. They want to go to the Golden Globes and wear their pins and talk about how important this is to them, and it never lasts. It becomes partial to political parties, uh, partial to uh, females instead of men who come forward. Look at the story of Terry Crews, who tried to join the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement and was ridiculed yep. for being a man hopping into the space. They don't care for actual uh, looking into evidence and allegations, and they are partial to women who make false allegations, as we've seen with Amber Heard and many other women, much like the lady we just saw in the gym. What they do is they do what feels good to them. They do what furthers their own agenda. And I will say, much yes. like you said, Megan, the Time's Up movement and the Me Too movement could have been something good. We were correcting for past wrongs and past transgressions, but sometimes you overcorrect, and your mind can be so open that your brain falls out. And that's what happens happen with Time's Up. So you won't hear them saying it anymore. You won't hear them saying hashtag me too anymore because the movement exists in the moment and they move on. The believe all women thing was the first death knell to me too. Yep. Evita. That was the first death knell during the Justice Cabinet. You just you just have to knee jerk believe all women because we, we don't lie, I guess, because we got the double X instead of the XL. Right. Okay. Everybody knew that's not how it worked. But then to actually put a point on it by denying the, the pleas of women who had been hurt by Democrats there was no surviving that. There really wasn't. I mean, the women who went to Time's Up weren't all Democrats. They weren't all Republicans. They were women who were hurting, and this organization had no time for them. They only had time for their own partisan politics. We've seen it in industry after industry. When you're not on the right side of their woke battle, you're nothing to them. They don't care. If you're, if you're, if you're Black and you have a heterodox view of BLM like you do, Amala, forget it. They don't care. You, you know, you'll get called all the names. And you're for a woman who's accusing a Democrat, you're nothing to them. Right. They take everything that uh, they see, all these stories, and they essentially throw them through a filter. And if you don't come out on the other end, guess what? You're not protected by their movement. They do not care for your opinion. They do not care for your trauma, even though they all talk about how traumatized they are. All of it goes through the filter. And if you don't come out on the other end, you better believe you're not going to be protected by them. Mm -hmm. I'll say this. Um, I have a lawyer named Brian Friedman, and he is a killer. And if you have a good case, like, he will kill for you. He will. And if somebody brings a false case against you, he will kill for you. That's what you need. Find a good lawyer. Find yourself a good lawyer. Don't, don't join these organizations, honestly, because this is what happens. They get corrupted. And then where's Reese Witherspoon? You know, Evita, she's out there. She, she wasn't one of the sound bites we played, but she was big in Time's Up. Where's she coming out there to say, you're bullshit. You know, I, I'm pissed. I put my name on this. And I helped you. Like, all these women, Oprah, where's she now to help do the cleanup on this? Yeah, I, I think it was set up to fail from the very beginning, right? I mean, none of these women um, are, are are bipartisan champions of women's rights from the very beginning, right? I mean, the, they they could have come forward a long time ago. I think a lot of these major celebrities could have come forward a long time ago, and none of them did. And then when Me Too came out, now they said we're going to band together and, and start this whole movement together. Um, and my my question, I mean, I guess you, you 
people are, there are victims out there and there are also people who were compliant in all this. And I just wonder how many of, how many people knew stuff was happening and then didn't do anything based off of the way Time's Up has turned out, right? I mean, that they've, mm-hmm. they've turned their backs on so many women who needed help based off of partisan politics. And, and, and the, the moral bankruptcy of that just makes me think how many more people turned to them in the past before they started this whole virtue signaling organization. Yeah. I mean, listen, if their business is to help people like Jessica Fernandez, thank God they're gone. They shouldn't right. come back in any way, shape, or form. We don't need that. We need legitimate, honest lawyers helping women who have legitimate, honest claims, and guys, too, who can suffer from the same problem. Uh, and and no, no sweeping narratives. No, no all men are bad. No believe all women. None of it. Uh, it. That's not the way this was ever meant to go. It's been such a pleasure, you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Let's do it again. I really enjoyed it. All the best to you both. Like many people, I am eating healthier these days, and that's why I love good olive oil. And by good, I mean fresh. Freshness makes all the difference. Olive oil packs the most flavor and healthiest nutrients when it's fresh from the farm. And that is the problem with supermarket olive oils. They're not fresh. They can be sitting on that shelf for God knows how many months growing stale. That is why I like my olive oil direct from small, award-winning farms, and I get it thanks to a guy named TJ Robinson, also known as the olive oil hunter. When I first tasted TJ's farm fresh oils, I fell in love with them. Vibrant, grassy, delicious flavors. They are amazing on salads, veggies, pasta, meat, fish, whatever you put olive oil on. And as an introduction to his fresh-pressed olive oil club, TJ is willing to send you a full-size bottle of one of the world's finest artisanal olive oils. It's worth $39 for just $1 charged to you, just one, to help him cover the shipping. Best of all, there's never a commitment to buy anything, and you can cancel your membership at any time. Get your free $39 bottle for just $1 shipping and taste the difference freshness makes. Go to harvestfreshnow.com, harvestfreshnow.com, for a free bottle and pay just $1 in shipping. HarvestFreshNow.com. Prince Andrew is reportedly preparing to mount a new battle to get his accuser in connection with the Jeffrey Epstein scandal to retract her allegations against him and apologize. This years after he entered into a settlement with said accuser, This is pretty much over and done with, so why would he be trying to reopen it? My guest today is one of the most well-connected and respected royal reporters in the UK. He has covered the monarchy for a quarter of a century. He broke the report about the allegations of bullying by Meghan Markle against her staff. Valentine Lowe is the author of the book Courtiers, Intrigue, Ambition, and the power players behind the House of Windsor. Valentine, what a pleasure to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. So let's start with Prince Andrew, since this news is brand new. Um, Ghislaine Maxwell giving an interview from Behind Bars, and uh, it aired last night in the UK, saying a lot of things, (laughs) a lot of things, but providing some help to Prince Andrew who, of course, has been uh, sort of booted out as a war, as a working royal uh, in the wake of this scandal. He was friends with Jeffrey Epstein. He went to see Jeffrey Epstein even after Epstein had pleaded guilty uh, in connection with some of his behavior toward young women. And um, it's been a stain around the royal family, around Prince Andrew, for years now. Ghislaine Maxwell convicted on her own charges of facilitating sexual assaults against young women as Jeffrey Epstein's partner at times romantic, at times business, at times, I don't know how else to explain the remainder of their relationship. But here is what she now says about this infamous photo that many of us have seen. This young woman, Virginia Jufre, accused Prince Andrew of helping traffic her, of, of sexually abusing her at least three times uh, a long time ago. And there is one photograph of the two of them, Virginia and Prince Andrew, allegedly at Ghislaine Maxwell's home in the UK. Um, Some have suggested it's a fake. Prince Andrew said that. And Ghislaine Maxwell providing some support for that. Here she is last night. I don't believe it's real for a second. In fact, I'm sure it's not. There's never been an original. And further, there's no 
photograph, and I've only ever seen a photocopy of it. She doesn't believe it's real. She thinks it's fake. And uh, this news breaks as we hear that Prince Andrew may be seeking to undo the settlement agreement that he entered into with Giffray a couple of years back. What do you make of all of that? Well, there's so much to say. And one is, you, you talk about um, Gillian Maxwell uh, giving him help from jail. I'm not sure how helpful her interview is. Um, <laughs> she's a convicted felon. Um, and what she has to say about the photograph, I mean, people connected to Andrew have been trying to put across this image for a long time that the picture may be, be a fake. But they've never come up with any evidence. And, and when my sister newspaper, the Sunday Times, uh, looked at it, um, that they got you know photographic and computer experts to to look at the picture to see if there's any evidence of photoshopping, and they couldn't find any. So uh, they've had a long time in which to you know pull apart this photograph and show it's not what it is meant to be, and they failed to do so. So I'm not sure how much credibility we give to that, uh, and yeah. I'm not sure how how much use Gillian Maxwell's intervention is to Andrew. Well, and they were always friends, were they not? I mean, this is sort of how he came into the orbit of Jeffrey Epstein. It was through Ghislaine Maxwell. That's right. They've, they've been friends for a long time. They've had, had a close relationship. Um, and it, it was it was through her that he, he met Jeffrey Epstein, yeah. So, yeah, so she's got some knowledge of the relationship, and she is to, in some ways, be blamed for the relationship and the introduction and the, whatever royal exposure Jeffrey Epstein had. Um, it's sort of bizarre to hear her speaking up from behind bars. She did also weigh in, for the sake of the audience, on whether she believes Jeffrey Epstein actually killed himself. Here's a little bit of that. I believe that he was uh, murdered. Well, I was shocked. And I wondered how it had happened. I obviously wish I'd never met him because I didn't know <laughs> that he was so awful. I mean, obviously now, looking back with hindsight, of course, but at the time, I mean, he had lots of friends. I mean, he was friendly with just about everybody you can imagine. There she is with Talk TV. I didn't know he was so awful. Of course, a jury has found something very different and has found that she was awful in her own right. What is going on here? What? Why is she doing this? What What do you think are the dynamics behind this? I, I, you know, maybe she's working up to an appeal, perhaps. I don't know what on earth she hopes to achieve by that. And coming out with this stuff about, you know, I didn't know how awful he was. I mean, come on. She was his right-hand woman for all those years. She was she was procuring these young girls for him. She was stopping young girls in the street and, and getting them to come into his harem, as it were. I mean, the idea that she didn't know is... It's just laughable. She's pursuing the he didn't kill himself thing, right? That he was murdered. A lot of people continue to believe that. I mean, I will say that the attorney general at the time, Bill Barr, under President Trump, says he personally reviewed the tapes of the jail that night on the night in question, and there was no entry of another person um, onto the floor where Jeffrey Epstein was being kept. And he is 100% assured that. Jeffrey Epstein was not murdered. However, famed uh, pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden was on Fox News last night saying the following to Tucker Carlson, sought for. I was present at the autopsy, and there were uh, three fractures in the windpipe uh, that are much more typical of crush injury from homicidal strangulation than from hanging. Hemorrhages in the eyes, again, more... Uh, typical of uh, uh, homicide. And uh, the ligature imprint on the neck didn't match the uh, ligature that was present in the cell. So I thought that uh, made it more likely uh, that this was a homicide. But we never got to, to find out how the body was found. Was he found hanging or not, for example? Because the two, the two guards were sleeping. The body was just cut down and brought out to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. Hmm. Ghislaine Maxwell suggesting it was murder as well. I mean, she of all people would know what secrets he had that had not yet been revealed upon his death, Valentine. I, absolutely. I'm sure she knows an awful lot, um, which she, she'll never tell. I mean, but, you know, in a way, the secrets um, are not the important thing. We, we know enough 
the truth that's already out there is damning enough without their us being reliant on further secrets. Um, so I think you know um, we need more than too much what Ghislaine and Maxwell hasn't told because uh, what what's been told already is is just damning enough. How what do you make of how this has landed for Prince Andrew? Because I hear these reports now that he wants to undo the settlement agreement he entered into with Virginia Giuffre. Um, that wasn't that long ago that, that they entered into that agreement. Potentially, they said uh, he was trying to head off trouble before the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, and the Queen didn't want this lawsuit in the news. And so he paid off Virginia Giuffre to go away. There are reports it was maybe $10 million. And um, she did go away. And then there was a, a voluntarily uh, agreed to gag order between the two of them for some 12 months. We're getting to the end of that. February will be the end of it. But I'll tell you, as a lawyer, Valentine, there is no way he's undoing that settlement agreement. He has zero grounds to undo that settlement. He reportedly is looking at what happened with Alan Dershowitz, who I believe 100% Virginia Giuffre falsely accused. And he's a lawyer, a famous one. So he fought. He fought tooth and nail. And he got her to essentially admit, oh, I may have misremembered when it comes to you. Reportedly, Prince Andrew saw that and said, hey, I like your outcome better than I like my, my outcome. And Dershowitz <laughs> is reportedly advising him behind the scenes. I don't see any legal grounds for him to undo this thing. But how do you think it's landed for Prince Andrew? Um, I think what you have to remember about Prince Andrew is he's none too bright. Uh, and he's reliant on the advice he gets. And I don't think he's been getting the best advice. Uh, I think he's he's very close uh, to his lawyer. His lawyer uh, basically has been telling him what he thinks Andrew wants to hear. And he's been constantly been telling him that, you know, Andrew, you can, you know, recover your life as a, as a, as a member of the royal family when that's just, that's just not going to happen. That's cloud cuckoo land. Um, so, yes, you're completely right that Andrew hasn't got a hope in hell of... Um, overturning this uh, and you know or we just know this from the from the journalist who interviewed Gillian Maxwell Daphne Barak uh, that that's what they want to do um, but you know we've heard all these this optimistic t- talk before from Andrew you know um, or from Andrew's you know associates that you know he'll cut, be back as a member of the royal family he'll overturn the legal case uh, it's just nonsense and I think there are really two things about Andrew the two possibilities one is he slept with uh, Virginia Giuffre, one is he didn't. If he did, he should have admitted it straight at the beginning. And you know, he, he would have come in for some criticism, but he would not have gone through all this pain. And if he didn't, he should have done a better job of fighting it. Um, mm. I think, obviously, the Jubilee uh, was uh, an issue in um, the decision to settle. But I don't think the Queen would have put herself would have put pressure on that on Andrew, not for one second. Uh, um, she loved her son. She wanted to do right by him, uh, and the idea of her saying to him, "Oh, settle this case, make it all go away," to, in order not to spoil my lovely jubilee—that's uh, not the way it would have worked, in my opinion. Who would have made him do it, if anyone? Um, well, <laughs> I, I think Andrew won't be listening to advice from the palace, certainly. He's got a long track record of not listening to advice from the palace. He just has a very, very small group of one or two people around him who he listens to. Um, and I think they told him to settle because they thought he was going to lose. Mm, I Maybe they know more than we do. Certainly, they know more than we do about what proof there is. But Virginia Giuffre, with all due respect, because she was trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein, I have zero doubt of that, but she's a very problematic witness. Uh, for anybody representing her. Her stories have been all over the board. Her her fundamental memories about, I remember because I was 16, she then would completely state the opposite not long thereafter, under oath testimony that was diametrically opposed to earlier under oath testimony by her. Um, this, is, this is one of the things that Alan Dershowitz took the time to actually figure out and fought her. And it, he came on my show early on when we launched this show, Valentine, we talked about some of the evidence about her, this is how Alan Dershowitz got pulled into the Virginia Giuffre story. And, and the left here in America is still holding this against him as though he's another Jeffrey Epstein, Alan Dershowitz. It's a lie. It's not true. And, um, and even now his accuser has said she may have misremembered. So it, Virginia Giuffre was writing to a journalist who had helped her, uh, who had interviewed her years before. 
and she was helping Virginia Dufre sell a book. And Virginia Dufre said, can you help me? Um, you know, my brain feels like mush. And I'd, I'd love to remember more about what you and I discussed when you interviewed me years ago. And this woman responds to her, Sharon Churcher, saying, don't forget Alan Dershowitz, Epstein's buddy and lawyer. Good name for your pitch for her book. As he represented Klaus von Bülow, and a movie was made about that case. The title was Reversal of Fortune. We all suspect Alan is a pedo, though no proof of that. You probably met him when he was hanging out with Epstein. That is how Alan's name got mentioned by Virginia Dufre. And I'd love to see the background of how it, Prince Andrew was mentioned. I realize Prince Andrew is not that popular in the UK, but I really don't know whether he was being railroaded in this same way. Yeah, I mean, that's extraordinary what, what you told me about Dershowitz. I hadn't heard that before. Uh, but of course, the difference is with Andrew, we, we have this picture. Uh, and the picture is, you know, it's not damning, but it's suggestive, isn't it? Um, and as, as we've already said, uh, there hasn't been any evidence yet. People suggest it's fake, but there hasn't been any evidence that it's fake. Um, mm. And we can't trust the word of Ghislaine Maxwell at all. <laughs> at all. No. I mean, and Virginia... <laughs> Virginia Dufresne is only 17 years old uh, in that picture when she met Prince Andrew reportedly. So this is, hence, one of the reasons why it becomes a scandal. Well, yeah. we'll continue to follow that, but you heard it here first. In order to undo that settlement agreement, he would have to prove it was the product of fraud, duress, mistake, or accident. And duress means like someone's got a gun to your head and they're saying, you will sign it or you will get, you know, this gun will go off. It's not like, oh, gee, the royal family really made me do it. Like, that, that's not going to yeah. do it. So he's not going to undo that settlement agreement. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's switch over to your book, which I thought was amazing. When when the first excerpts were released in the UK, I was riveted. And that's when I said, I must meet Valentine Lowe. He's got to come on the show. So thank you so much for being here to walk us through some of it. You, you are the person who broke the whole Meghan Markle bullying scandal. And one of the things I think is most interesting about this is Prince Harry on his recent media tour went on about, oh, so obvious the, the palace starts talking about her bullying right before the Oprah interview. I mean, you'd have to be stupid to believe this was not a made-up attempt at um, maligning Meghan unfairly. But the truth is, you've seen the documents. There are papers in which this behavior is documented going back to, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's October of 2018. This was not a made-up scandal because she went on Oprah. No, so a um, couple of things to say that, yeah, yes, the original um, memo making the bullying, bullying accusation was in October of 2018. Um, first of all, Harry you know, talks about the, the palace, and, and this is an allegation um, that Meghan's lawyers made um, when they responded to me, that this was um, clearly an attempt to smear by Buckingham Palace. And that's, yeah, you know, obviously I'm not going to get into my sources for the story, but that's a ludicrous allegation. Because if you read what I wrote, the Buckingham Palace does not emerge well from this. They messed up. They messed up because they did nothing. These allegations of bullying were made, and they did absolutely nothing. They just sat in it. Um, so the idea that Buckingham Palace should put this out is, is just a joke. The other thing is the timing of the story. Um, when I wrote that story in March of 2021, uh, I, I did a lot of immediate interviews. Uh, and also when I, when I wrote in the Times, I was completely upfront that the timing was connected to Oprah. And the reason why is, is because the, the victims of the bullying, they wanted their story out there. Um, they wanted the world to know that, you know, there's Megan betraying herself as a victim of, of, of the palace, essentially. And they wanted to say that there are other victims out here. And if they had put their story out after Oprah, it just would have been lost in the noise. No one would have paid any attention. And it also would have um, come across as sour grapes. So the only way to make sure they got heard was to make sure their story came out before Oprah. So it's not some evil palace conspiracy. It's just the way that the, the way these young people suffered uh, in, their, in their view at the hands of Meghan. Um, they just wanted that to be heard by the, by the rest of the world. And whereas Meghan, I mean, we heard from Gail King after her best friend Oprah interviewed them. Meghan has the receipts. 
She's got the documentation to prove every claim she made in that interview. And yet now we've watched six hours of Netflix and we've read Prince Harry's memoir, Spare, and there are no receipts. We, there is nothing to prove that the royal family has a racist who's concerned about how dark the baby's skin is going to be or these other allegations that she said to Oprah. Um, however, you do have receipts. You claim in the book to have seen receipts, so to speak, of the bullying, including uh, you read as follows. On October 26th, 2018, just as Harry and Meghan were flying from Tonga to Sydney for the Invictus Games, Jason, is it Knopf? Is that how you pronounce his name? Knopf, yeah. Jason Knopf, Knopf who um, worked for, at a, for a time, he worked for William, Kate, and Harry, and then he split off to just William and Kate after things went south with Meghan and Harry. Uh, Knopf wrote an email to his immediate boss, Simon Case, Prince William's private secretary, saying he had spoken to the head of HR for the palace, again, this is 2018, about, quote, some very serious problems concerning Meghan's behavior. He wrote, quote, I am very concerned that the Duchess was able to bully two PAs out of the household in the past year. The Duchess seems intent on always having someone in her sights. She is bullying X, name withheld by author, and seeking to undermine her confidence. We have report after report from people who have witnessed unacceptable behavior toward X, despite the universal views from her colleagues that she's a leading talent within the household who's delivering first-rate work. Uh, Knauf, who's in daily contact with the staff, went on to say that the tour was very challenging and was made worse by the behavior of the Duchess and goes on from there saying the situation is very serious. So did you actually get to see this memo, Valentine? Uh, I had that memo um, read out to me. I didn't physically see it, uh, but I have also, um, my source also showed me, should we say, physical evidence of other conversations uh, backing up the um, a- allegation of bullying and um, testimony uh, from members of staff about the effect that Meghan's behavior have had on them. You know, people talking about how they were shaking with fear because they anticipated uh, getting a roasting from Meghan uh, and how they felt physically sick. Um, and it, it's, it was obviously not a healthy working atmosphere. Um, there was one. There was one point when um, one uh, member of staff was uh, trying to do something at a meeting that Megan was, was was trying to explain why something was difficult, and Megan said to her, "Don't worry. If there's literally anyone else I could get to do this, I would." And that poor person was absolutely crushed. Uh, and just one of the many examples of being, you know, it's completely squashed by Meghan. And a short while later, Prince William uh, saw this person in the corridor uh, and said, um, "Oh, look, listen, I'm, I, yeah, I hear you've been having a bit, a bit of a bad time. I'm really sorry, but just want you to know you're doing a really great job." And they just burst into tears. It was, it was just mm. so, so broken at that point. People, people were broken. What walk us through? Like, tell us a little bit, because, you know, the book is about all the people around the royal family, courtiers. Um, Walk us through who these people are, not in terms of identity. But when I read this, part of me asked myself, why is everybody always crying around her? Either she's terrible or these are a bunch of snowflakes, right? Like, are these snowflakes? Are these just weak need people serving the royal family who need to toughen up a little? No, they're they're not snowflakes. And let me tell you a bit about about the... um, two people who were closest uh, to Harry and Meghan in the the period we're talking about. Uh, So their private secretary was an Australian woman uh, called Samantha Cohen, who worked for the Queen for a long time, Uh, incredibly uh, able, uh, popular. The Queen loved her, very very tough as well, and very imaginative. And um, everyone everyone liked Sam. And the communications person was uh, a woman called Sarah Latham, who has... Uh, dual US uh, and UK uh, nationality, and um, very tough, very experienced media professional. And these these two people, so first of all, there's a point to be made that they're not stuffy old Brits. You know, so the idea that the wicked old palace, tweedy old courtiers, crushing the spirit of free, uh, you know, free, free thinking Megan, that's just not true. Uh, and the other is, 
that they believed they believed in it at the beginning. They were they were very much on Harry and Meghan's side, uh, and they wanted to make it work, and they did everything they could to make it work. But by the end of it, they they and other uh, people who work for Harry and Meghan were calling themselves the Sussex Survivors Club. And uh, they were saying things like they were describing Meghan as a narcissistic sociopath. Uh, and mm. in one incredibly telling phrase, uh, they said, we were played. They, they felt they were manipulated by Meghan and let down by her. So, you know, it all started off with the best of intentions and it just collapsed amid such acrimony. You know, Prince Harry, on his recent media tour, talks about how this is all made up, about how Meghan was the most giving, gentle boss you, one could ever ask for inside the palace, how she was sharing all the perfume and the clothing and the gifts that she received from outside vendors, which we know from your reporting and others, she wasn't supposed to accept, but she she was getting it and sharing it with the staff. She was baking them cupcakes and cakes for their birthdays. She was just a mother earth over the staff, the way Harry tells it. Not true? Yeah, look, you can be mother earth on one hand uh, and a bit of a bully on the other. I mean, the two can, can, walk, can walk hand in hand. Um, I think Megan, you know, when she was being lovely, I'm sure she was being lovely, but she could also, you know, if these reports are true, could be very, very difficult. And you know, Harry in his book he refer he 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 talks very briefly about bullying. It's interesting how how little he goes into it. He 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 doesn't feel the need to sort of address it too seriously. Uh, but he says they they produced something like was it, I think it was a twenty or twenty five page uh, dossier of evidence. Uh, well, I'd love to see that because. <laughs> I'm not sure that it would really address the question. But Megan, this is absolutely typical Megan. She responds to things with just a deluge of words. Um, in her court case against the British newspaper, the Mail on Sunday, which she um, uh, accused of breach of privacy uh, and copyright when it published uh, excerpts from a letter she wrote to her father. Uh, this is a case that she won, by the way. You should point that out. Mm -hmm. um, but in that court case, um, she, she, she basically said that she hadn't collaborated uh, with um, a biography of, about, about Harry and Meghan uh, finding freedom. Right. Uh, and then Jason Canal submitted his own witness statement to the court um, and said, um, well, actually, she did in the sense that she briefed me to talk to these authors and she gave me talking points. She, she, she listed a series of points that she wanted me to brief the authors on. So then Megan just produces another witness statement, and it's just pages and pages long justifying herself, um, including saying, oh, yeah, sorry, um, yeah, I forgot about that. You know, I forgot. I <laughs> yeah. and Ridiculous. One, one of the tabloids in Britain um, did a fantastic front page uh, inspired by some children's books that were popular here a few years a few years back, and it was called Little Miss Forgetful. <laughs> it was really yeah. and so she, that, she, she, that's, so she was, that's a kindness to suggest it actually was forgetfulness. That is a kindness. We, I mean, that's yeah. an obvious lie, and it's one of the reasons why the Mail was saying this is an absurd decision. You know that she's she's lied repeatedly. She's lying about her participation in the press around this letter and in general, and the court, I, I really think the court reached the wrong decision in that case um, by allowing her to claim her privacy had been violated when she was the one who helped who helped put it out there. In any event, let, the thing about Megan is interesting, and before we get to Harry, because one of the biggest revelations I found in your book was how obsessed Harry is, not just about Megan's press, about his own, about him, about his standing, as despair, as like, what, how are they going to write about him? Is he going to stay relevant? So we'll get to that in one second. But before we leave this particular subject, you write in the book that that Megan's obsession with her own press um, in, in connection with her relationship with Harry began very early. And he might have been one of the first people she bullied when you claim that she demanded he go out there and announce that she was his girlfriend and start picking fights with the media to clean up her press coverage. Yeah, and they, I mean, and, and we're going to be fair to them for a moment. I think they, they probably had a bit of a rough time when, it, when her name first appeared 
uh, as his girlfriend. Yeah, suddenly she's got the whole press uh, camping on her doorstep in Toronto. Uh, everyone she's ever known, every boyfriend, every member of her family uh, is being uh, approached by journalists. Yeah, that, that, that's a kind of, that's a rough, rough introduction. No, it isn't. The, she loved it, Valentine. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I don't. I totally disagree with you. But go ahead. Okay. Well, we'll we'll have we'll have we'll have to do that. Um, but um, yeah, they they wanted to stop you know stop that intrusive coverage and what they saw as the uh, bad behavior of the media. Uh, and Megan also said, "Yeah, uh, you've got to acknowledge me as your girlfriend." And you know, I I've been told that she she threatened to to dump him. That's that's what Harry was frightened of that she would break off the relationship. Unless, uh, unless she he acknowledged in his statement that uh, she was his girlfriend, mm-hmm. and, I'm, uh, and she, I'm not surprised. She, she there was a, there was a hint of what was to come, and she she said to a senior member of the staff, "You know, I know how this works. You don't care about the girlfriend." So she was already putting a sort of combative spin on it then, uh, and and laying the seeds of a narrative about her rejection. And so, and some wow. of those people who worked work for Harry and Meghan said that you know, she always wanted to be rejected. And that's what this That's so about. interesting. Yes, I read that in your book where, where they were saying, we, we're so dumb. We always knew that the media coverage was going to depend on her happiness. Her happiness was going to drive everything. What we didn't realize was she wasn't interested in happiness. She wanted to be rejected. That was the whole narrative she was trying to sew from the beginning. Yeah, that's right. That's what they're saying. Um, and, why? 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 Yeah. Why did she want to do that? I have, you know, if I could delve into the psychology of Megan, I I would. But it, it's 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 very funny. You know, she could have done so much good in that job because you know when she first arrived, I thought she was a breath of fresh air. I thought she was really int- interesting. She did some good things, and I thought it would do the royal family a lot of good if someone a bit different came in. Uh, you know, she would had a proper career. She was American. She was divorced. She had this, this special background. I thought it would shake up the royal family, uh, and she did things which were terrific. Uh, but but she just wanted everything on her own terms and wasn't prepared to compromise. Hmm. And it's so much more fun when you are a woke American to be the victim than the victor. It's a sickness <laughs> infecting far too many people in my country and yours. Stand by, because up next, what I really found to be the most revealing part of Valentine's book about Harry, the guy is obsessed with whom? With his little nephew, Prince George, who's coming up behind him and is going to be more relevant than he is very soon. Stand by for that. So, Valentine, um, the subject of Harry, there's been a lot of discussion about whether, you know, Meghan did this to him. (laughs) You know, hearing him read this book and how just absurd he sounded in some of the passages. What, What a complainer, what a whiner, how he can't stop with the media. And a lot of people believe she did this to him. Um, I think your book reveals he was like this, long before he met Megan, and then she exacerbated it. Can you talk about how obsessed he was with his media coverage and his relevance before she ever came into the picture? Yeah. Um, I, I think what, they, what happened is, is those two found each other. They both have a profound sense of victimhood, um, and they fed off each other, and it just spiraled. But yeah, he's long had um, an obs- I, I characterize it slightly differently to the way you characterize it. He's long had a deep hatred and mistrust of the media, which is incredibly understandable. And I think, in a funny way, I'd think the le- less of him if he didn't, because of what happened to his mother and the way mm-hmm. the media treated his mother, the way they pursued her. I mean, yes, she also encouraged them because she colluded with the media. We all know that. But, you know, she couldn't go anywhere without being chased by the paps. Uh, and we all know the role that they played in her death. Um, so his hatred and mistrust of the media is perfectly understandable. But it's very interesting to contrast it with his brother, William, uh, who 
basically also hates the media, really, deep down. But he's learned how to deal with it. He's learned how to come to an accommodation because he realizes they're not going to go away. Uh, and also, they're not all bad. I mean, the, the entire gamut of media is not the same as the paps who you know chased his mother and uh, were around at the beginning of Harry and Meghan. Uh, but of course, Harry doesn't. Harry doesn't recognize subtle. He, Sally, Harry, Harry doesn't really do shades of gray. He does black and white, and the whole mm. media is awful and evil. Um, so he, any anything that the media got wrong, he would obsessively want to get it corrected. He he was always absolutely focused on getting things corrected. And um, even when the BBC in Britain um, there was a, there was a comedy panel show and someone um, uh, made a joke about Harry and, Harry and drugs. Um, he's got a friend um, called uh, Sam Van Cutsum and someone made a joke on air about um, uh, Thomas, Thomas Van Cutsum and Harry smokes them, um, <laughs> which wasn't a bad joke, but Harry was just furious and he went to such lengths to get the BBC to apologise. Uh, and, and including having a, a big meeting with someone very, very senior in the BBC, um, My goodness. Who, who said, in a way, quite rightly, this is this is comedy. It's a joke. You're not meant to take it too seriously. But that was mm -hmm. where, where Harry was coming from. Um, so he always he always hated me. He always wanted to get things corrected. Um, uh, but he had so, there was so much else going on with him even before Meghan turned up. So he he always had this mistrust of the courtiers from the other households, from, from Buckingham Palace, the Queen's headquarters, and from Clarence House, which was his father, Prince Charles's headquarters. He just really didn't trust them at all. Uh, and he was always, um, you know, as for giving loyalty tests to his staff, um, he was always saying, you know, you know, are you helping me on this or, or are you one of them? And one of them meant, you know, the other courtiers, the other households who were, in his view, compromise and were, didn't really have his, own, his, his best interest at heart. Um, but his other thing was he had an obsession with his shelf life. Um, because, you know, Harry, for, his, for all his faults, Harry's got a lot of good points. And he wanted to use his position, his, this privileged position as a member of the royal family, to do good in the world. And we saw that with Inv Invictus Games, where in the United States, in, in Colorado Springs, he saw the Warrior Games for in, injured and otherwise disabled ex-service people uh, to take part in sort of Paralympic-style games. And he thought that was a terrific idea. And basically, he was going to steal it and make it international. Uh, uh, and, and he did it. He, he did it incredibly quickly. Um, it was like less than a year from seeing the Warrior Games to when the first Invictus Games uh, happened in London. So he's got a, he's got a lot of energy. Uh, he's got a lot of passion. He wants to do good, but he thinks, uh, with yeah, you know, with some justification, uh, that there's a limited time in which he can do all that, because you know when he becomes middle aged, uh, when uh, young royals come are coming up uh, the inside track, people aren't going to be interested in him. Was his view, uh, and so you know, as he would put it, you know, by the time Prince George is eighteen, everyone's going to be focusing on George. No one will care less about correct. Uncle. <laughs> I mean, he's <laughs> not. You're he's not wrong. We want to know about George and Charlotte and Louis now. Never yeah. mind when they're actually becoming of age and they're adults, and George is getting closer to his yeah. role in the in the hierarchy. But to me, this is so interesting because, in part, it explains why he chose her. It's no actress. It's no accident he wound up with an American actress. The sizzle of it, her B-list fame, her ability to navigate the camera. It wasn't just, oh, I need somebody who can do that here in Great Britain because we'll be the subject of uh, the photographers. It was, I want another social climber. I think he was a trap. He had it too. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, I don't think Harry craves attention for the sake of it. I don't think he... he wants the spotlight for, you know to shine on him just for his own sake i think he he always wanted it to do to do good i think he he and his wife are slightly different in that respect um well how do you explain it, spare it was a long howl of anguish is what spare was i mean just to read it it's it's such a sad book um 
his his bit, he's so damaged uh, and you know reading about his fractured family relations it's quite an insight to realize that um his relationship with his brother was not nearly as good as we thought it was. in the days when we still thought yes. it was good it was not nearly as good as we thought it was um uh yeah so harry just wants to complain against the, about the world uh, chiefly about the media and also about his family but i i i know someone who used to have um a lot of dealings with william uh and william would occasionally bring harry along and this person said to me the thing that harry was he's always complaining he always saw the negative side of things and you and you see this you see this in the book it's negative 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 um and the way he portrayed, you know, so one of the, the big, big themes in the book is you know, how awful the media were, are, uh, can't trust them, and they portray me and Megan in a terrible light. Well, for a start, there was much, much more positive coverage of Megan than he gives credit for uh, for, for a long time. Yes, it started to get, get critical, but it was much better than he thinks. And there, there are specific instances, it's very interesting, uh, where he talks about the coverage. And there was a time they just got married, they'd been on a honeymoon, they'd come back, and Megan goes off and has a day out uh, in the sort of north of England uh, with the Queen. It's what they call an away day. And they go up by royal train, uh, which was an you know, unusual thing. So just the Queen and Megan. And I remember seeing them off the, 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 the train. Uh, I was there on the platform. Uh, and it was a big day, and all the reporters up there, we were all excited. Um, Ha there was a bit of a bit of a kerfuffle about getting out the car at one point. Yeah, who did the Queen get in or out first, or was it Meghan? You know, there was a slight confusion, and people mentioned it in their reports. But Harry says of it that the press portrayed the day as a mitigated disaster. Uh. And I thought, hang on, hang on, hang on. I I was there, and I wrote it up, and my colleagues wrote it up. Let's, let me remind myself, and I looked up. Every single newspaper, including the newspapers that Harry hates the most, the you know, papers in, the, in Britain like the Sun and the Daily Mail, which really get all his absolute in, invective. Um, and I looked them all up, and they were all glowingly positive. I mean, it was a lovely day out. There were lovely pictures. There was a fantastic picture of the, of the opening of some bridge, uh, uh, the Queen and Meghan sitting there, and they were they were laughing at it. So having a right old giggle together. Um, you know, hey, Valentine, well, you know how um, people who have eating disorders have body dysmorphia? He's got press dysmorphia. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way of putting it. Um, he, he, yeah, he, 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 he thinks we're monsters and he only sees the negative and just, he forgets about the positive. And, and it's really hurting him. It's hurting her. She's got the same thing. It's hurting her too. Because your book reveals that she actually thought she was going to be the Beyonce of the UK. And instead, yeah. what we saw, well, the, their approval ratings in the UK have been below water for a long time now. The UK has turned on yeah. them. But what yeah, we saw this week so. is so has America. Uh, Newsweek reporting on a poll just out uh, showing that he has fallen 45 points in his approval approval rating here in America is a 45 point swing from where he was and she has fallen 36 points uh since they've decided to do this press tour the Netflix the spare all of it it's not working because to your point no one likes a whiner they don't like it even yeah. from somebody who has the right to whine and they really don't like it from somebody who's complaining about how small their castle is <laughs> yeah uh, and they you know, they they wanted to break away. Um, and sure, if, if they wanted to air their complaints, air, the, air your complaints once. But you've got to move on. You've got to you've got to prove to the world that you've got something positive to say, positive to say and positive to contribute. Uh, and well, we, we've yet to see that really. Well, don't you think? I mean, I, I've been watching what's happened with Camilla, and I'm old enough to have lived through that whole thing when she was absolutely the villain. She was the third party in the marriage. The, the world was on Princess Diana's side. We all felt her victimhood. You know, as time goes on, you learn more facts and it becomes a little bit more complex. Um, yeah. But she wasn't out there complaining. She took her licks 
for years. And that doesn't mean she never tried to shape press behind the scenes, but I never saw her out there doing the woe is me tour like these two who haven't had it anywhere near as bad as she's had it or as many public figures have it when it comes to the media. Over time, my own experience as a public figure is over time, people will actually grow to respect you if you just try to stay above it, take your licks and move on. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, Camilla, um, she, she's, she's tough as anything. I think she, she felt a lot of pain when she was getting all this criticism. She, she had some pretty dark moments, but she knuckled down and did the work and she knew that it was, it was going to be, it would take years, uh, uh, to rehabilitate uh, her image. And that's what she was prepared to, to do. Um, and Harry and Meghan kind of wanted instant results. Um, and that's you know, not the way it's going to work. Um, now, now he villainizes her and says that his negative coverage was a, as a result of her trading stories about him to improve her own press. Yeah, and even that he gets wrong. He gets so much wrong in the book. He, he basically, by implication, accuses her of leaking the details of the first conversation that she had with William when she first met William properly, uh, when in fact it wasn't her at all. Um, she talked about it to her one of her aides, and the aide had um, mentioned it to someone and leaked out that way. And the aide actually mm. resigned over it. They they mm. fell on their sword. Um, they they were later taken back again. But you know, the the blame is is clear there. What happened? And it and it wasn't Camilla leaking it. So here we are. Prince Charles's, uh, sorry, King Charles's coronation is set for May, and uh, there is tons of speculation about whether they will be there. Uh, the palace hasn't said one way or the other, but the UK is against them. And it, what a spectacle it will be if they are there. There is a very real chance they will be booed and hissed by the British public, even on such a, such a celebratory day, maybe especially because it's a celebratory day of the royal family of King Charles. What do you think is going to happen there? Yes, I mean, goodness, the, the idea of booing on the coronation would, 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 be, would be absolutely horrendous. Uh, well, I'm going to do it. Tell, it's very hard <laughs> to tell what's going to happen. Um, uh, I think it's incredibly unlikely that she will come because it will just be too much of a distract. Can you imagine those two turning up, Westminster Abbey, just you know, walking down the aisle, saying, oh, we'll, we'll just sit here, don't, don't mind about us, you know, we'll just sit here, behave as no need to paying attention to us. Uh, I can't imagine doesn't... them doing that. No. Uh, he, he might turn up. Um, it depends if there's been any kind of re reconciliation. They'll certainly get an invitation. I think um, there's no doubt do. that they will uh, be invited. Uh, but in order to heal that family rift, you've got to have peace talks. And peace talks involve private conversations, uh, delicate, even painful conversations. Uh, and how are those going to remain private? How are the royal family going to trust Harry when every private conversation he's ever had with them has been blasted all over the media, all around the world? It's a, it's a tricky. Mm -hmm. It's tricky to see how it's going to play out. I don't see peace talks as being the next move. I really think there has to be a while where people like Prince William get to have their anger and feel it for a bit, as opposed to being forced to make up with these two who continue attacking him nonstop knowing he can't fight back. It's, it's to stew in one's anger is, it, there's some cathartic pro property to it for some short period. Maybe it, maybe they'll reconcile eventually, but I don't know. I, for one, do not want to see those two at the coronation, and I will be booing loudly, Valentine, if they go. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Good luck with the book, Courtiers. It's well worth your time, everyone. You're going to love the way Valentine writes, too. All the best to you, sir. Thank you very much. And remember, folks, you can find The Megyn Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east, the full video show and clips too, by subscribing to our YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com slash Megyn Kelly. It's super fun over there. Uh, if you want it via audio podcast, you can get it via audio podcast for free. And you got 475 shows in the archives to enjoy if you want to go over there and subscribe and follow. Uh, okay, I want to tell our audience that tomorrow, Victor Davis Hansen, so excited to have VDH back on. Lots to go over with him. Can you imagine what he's going to say on these documents? That'll be fun. Plus, Mike Pompeo will be here. We'll ask him whether he's found any, <laughs> any top secret documents in his closets recently. 